does not indicate that we have something structural, structurally going on. The outside temperature is above 2,000 degrees. Seeing an increase in the wheel well of 30 to 40 degrees seems to indicate that that's not the point of any large thermal excursion. That's reflecting something else. Remember I told you yesterday we had uh, an increase of uh, temperature on the left side of the vehicle, on the mid fuselage. I believe I told you 60 degrees in five minutes. But a delta of change in temperature of 60 degrees, again, does not represent a structural problem. So even though these things are interesting to us, we're still trying to find what caused these temperatures to increase. And given the fact that the outside temperature on the wing leading edge is 2,000 degrees, these relatively small increases in temperature are telling us something. We're just trying to find out exactly what they're trying to tell us. Did we have some type of penetration in the wing that the left main landing gear and the left mid fuselage were just reflecting an overall increase in temperature, but were not the exact point of the penetration? That's what we're trying to figure out. So you can't draw the conclusions that the left main gear or the wheel well we had a breach there. If you had a breach there, it seems logical that the temperature would be higher than just 30 or 40 degrees from what we normally expect. But again, we're early in this investigation, and we're still pouring over the data. And this is the fluid nature of the business, so be cautious about those conclusions. We are certainly trying to be cautious ourselves. I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the uh, tile analysis. I know there are a lot of questions about that. I'll, I'll try to go through that in a fair amount of detail to help you understand um, what occurred. First thing I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the timeline, the events, when we did certain things, and when we finally concurred on it not being a problem. Launch occurred on the 16th of January. First film review occurred the following day on the 17th. The first engineering meetings occurred on the 20th. We reported to the debris assessment team on the 21st, which means the engineering teams were starting to do their work. They were trying to understand exactly what this debris was, and so they spent a day reflecting upon it, identifying the assumptions that they needed to utilizing their analysis, and they're reported to our debris assessment team on the 21st. They, did, they completed a, uh, an engineering analysis on the 22nd, final engineering reviews on the 23rd and the 24th, reported to the mission management team on the 24th, and again on the 27th. Both those times reporting to the mission management team, the conclusion was that the debris that uh, impacted the vehicle did not represent a threat to the safety of the crew or the vehicle. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the assumptions used in our analysis, because I've heard a lot of discussion in the last day concerning those assumptions. The size of the debris utilized in our assumptions was 20 inches by 16 inches by 6 inches. And the, and the weight was 2.67 pounds. The size was determined in two ways. One, we looked at the film and we estimated to the best of our ability the size of the debris. Secondly, we utilized the information that we gained on STS-112, where we had debris from the same area shed from the tank. The difference on 112 was that we had the film that the flight crew shot of the tank after the main engine cutoff and after ET separation. And as, as the ET was separating away from the orbiter, the crew was able to take pictures of the tank. And we clearly identified where the debris came from. And because of those photographs, we were able to understand the size of the debris that departed from the tank. 
we knew the size and the location, and that's why we could tell you it was from that bipod region. And based upon those photographs, we determined that the size of the debris, being somewhat conservative, was what I told you, 20 inches by 16 by 6. And the mass of, of that particular uh, piece of debris, again, determined based on the density of that size of debris. As we performed the analysis, we looked at different incident angles. The debris is not going to hit the underside of the wing at a 90 degree angle. It's coming from the tank and the orbiter relationship, if I can use this model for a second. The tank debris is coming from here. It's transporting down to the bottom of the vehicle at a slight incident angle and it's going to impact the wing and come off. It's not going to hit directly 90 degrees. So as it comes into the wing, you have to calculate how much energy it has depending on the mass and the size. So that's very important to us. We looked at incident angles varying from 10 degrees, 13, and 16 degrees. Again, trying to bound our analysis. We varied the weight of the debris. Again, trying to bound it. We utilized a program, a tool that we have, that we've used many, many times uh, to predict the penetration of any coating or the penetration of any tile based upon this debris. And this, we know from test and we know from previous flight experience that this particular tool over predicts damage to the bottom of the vehicle, to tile or to the wing leading edge. We've used it in the past when we have shed debris. We have used its results, its predictions, and compared it to actual flight experience when the vehicle returned and we were able to measure the debris. So we know that it over predicts. It also has a, some, conservative, some conservatism in the model itself. I won't go into those details. I haven't got those all, all captured for you yet. But I wanted to give you that background. As we completed the analysis, trying again to understand as we normally do the worst case, we looked at two primary, well, we looked at more than two, but the two worst cases were the loss of a single tile near the um, main landing gear door. And we also looked at the loss of uh, multiple tile, not that we lost the entire tile, but we lost a portion of the tile in a, in a larger area. And the area we looked at was 32 inches by approximately 7 inches, approximately 2 inches. So our model was predicting that we could have damage to the bottom of the wing near the the left main gear door, and on other areas, both uh, predominantly outboard from the main landing gear door to the tip of the wing, depending on the incident angle and depending on the size or mass of the, of the debris. So it varies. For the, uh, the loss of a single tile at the uh, main landing gear door, and for the other case uh, where you had more acreage damaged, the 32 by 7 by 2 inch area, in both those cases, the analysis predicted that even though you might have structural damage, and what I mean by structural damage is localized heating where you may have some effect on the basic structure in that area. Even though you might have localized structural damage, you would not have damage sufficient to cause a catastrophic event, nor impact the flying qualities of the vehicle. Now today we, uh, we, are, we are also going to release to you 
uh, our daily mission evaluation room reports. I believe we have 15 reports, and you can read through those reports, and it will reflect a lot about what I have just told you, probably in less detail than what I just shared with you. So why don't we stop at that point and, and give you a chance to ask me some questions. And again, I'm, I'm sharing with you information, as much information as I have available. And, and uh, again, ask for your indulgence as we change this information from day to day.